I finally made someone pay for all the that I've been through. I, I ordered a pizza and I bought a beer. And so I, I took my blood pizza because somebody died for me to get this pizza. I enjoyed every day of it, and I really did. My only regret is that I hadn't killed 30 more sons of bitches later. Located in the Orlando, Florida metropolitan area, the idyllic suburb of Winter Park is an affluent city, including the Park Avenue District. Among residents of the exclusive area were Reed Berman and his son Oliver. Reed, a successful commercial real estate executive, had a very demanding schedule. His salvation came in the form of an assistant who served as both nanny and house manager. Her name was Jennifer Fulford, and she'd worked for him somewhere between six and seven years. She was extremely reliable, and she did a wonderful job ensuring everything within the household was taken care of. To top it all off, she was said to be an exceptionally kind soul. The morning of September 27, 2017, had all the makings of a normal Wednesday, but it would quickly turn tragic. Jennifer and Oliver headed out on their commute to school around 7.15 or 7.20, and when Jennifer returned to the residence afterward, she and Reed briefly discussed the day's agenda. Jennifer had a dental appointment scheduled for 9 o'clock, then she'd meet with an art framer at the residence shortly thereafter. Other than that, it was business as usual, and she'd perform her maintenance tasks at the Berman home, then pick Oliver up from school at 3.30. As for Reed, he was on his way to a breakfast meeting. They said a quick goodbye, and though nothing seemed out of the ordinary, things were about to take a terrible turn. The first indication that something was off came in the form of a phone call from Oliver's school at 4 o'clock that afternoon. Reed was informed that Jennifer had failed to pick up his son upon dismissal. Though he tried, Reed was unable to reach Jennifer on her cell phone. It seemed it had been powered off. He picked Oliver up, and the pair returned home around 5 o'clock. Upon entry, the house was eerily quiet. Jennifer was nowhere to be found. What Reed did find, however, was quite peculiar. There sat Jennifer's purse right beside the toilet of one of the downstairs bathrooms. He noticed that the seat had been left up too. This was unusual considering he and Oliver rarely used that particular restroom. An inspection of the contents of Jennifer's purse was suspicious. Her wallet, cell phone, credit cards, and driver's license were missing. Her vehicle, a 2015 Hyundai Santa Fe, was nowhere to be found. At that point, Reed contacted law enforcement. However, it wasn't until approximately 6.25 that he made the call, and the reason behind the delay is unknown. Nevertheless, a Winter Park officer was quickly dispatched to his home. Reed shared what information he had with the officer. The last time he'd communicated with Jennifer had been through a text message he'd received from her a little after 11 o'clock that morning. Interestingly so, Reed had no contact information for Jennifer's husband, Robert. However, officers managed to locate him at the home he and Jennifer shared, somewhere around 7 p.m. He stated that he hadn't recently seen or spoken with Jennifer. He explained that she had an upcoming trip scheduled to visit her son and newborn granddaughter in Dallas, Texas, but wasn't due to depart until the evening of the following day. Even more troubling was the fact that neither Jennifer's children nor any of her close friends had seen or heard from her. It seemed that Jennifer had simply vanished. That very evening, Robert examined bank records in hopes of uncovering something that could aid in the investigation. As expected, he found a record of payment to Jennifer's dental office at 10.08 that morning. However, it was the transaction that followed that gave Robert pause. A Wells Fargo ATM was visited at 12.10 that afternoon, and a withdrawal of $300, the maximum amount allowed, occurred. According to Robert, the idea of Jennifer having withdrawn the funds was completely unlikely, or at least he thought so. Then a development came in the form of a realization that Jennifer's vehicle happened to be equipped with a service known as Blue Link, which allows Hyundai drivers to remotely access their vehicles using their smartphones. It was the hope Jennifer's SUV could be located with help from the system, but it was soon discovered that the vehicle was still registered under previous owners, and thus the account was inactive. When business hours resumed the following morning, 
Robert frantically completed necessary paperwork in order to have the system reactivated. And upon completion, Detective Dolls, who was one of several working the high-profile case, would be notified with any available data pertaining to the vehicle's whereabouts. Also that morning, the lead and assistant detectives paid a visit to Reed in order to conduct an interview. Reed led the detectives through his sizable home and showed them everything that seemed out of place or suspicious. He explained the details surrounding the unusual location of Jennifer's abandoned purse. Strangely enough, Reed hadn't noticed anything to be missing within the home, at least not yet. He hadn't found any sign of forced entry either. The previous evening, when he and Oliver had arrived home, the front door was locked, and according to Reed, whoever locked it clearly had a key. He also noted that it seemed Jennifer hadn't had a chance to complete her cleaning tasks. His bed remained unmade, and days later, he'd come to realize his comforter was missing. Trash bags littered the kitchen floor. It was as if Jennifer had been interrupted somewhere in the middle of her duties. Still, Reed was able to provide some extremely crucial information. He reviewed his alarm system activations for the previous day with the detectives. Initially, there was no sign that anything out of the ordinary had occurred. I went out this way, it's by 8.30. When you say this way, meaning the back? Yeah, my car is Yeah, going. with the garage. Yeah, I leave, the door opens, and now she's gotta to go to her nine o'clock. It's 8.43, the door opens, mm -hmm. she goes to the dentist, she comes home at about 10.35. Between 10.30 and 11.32, there's no penetration of anything, okay? So I'm just assuming she's here cleaning. However, a series of activations occurred thereafter, and they told an unsettling story. Then the door opens, but doesn't close. Again, the front door we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, at 11.47. Okay. 15 minutes after she comes home, it opens, but it doesn't close. Then three minutes later... The master bedroom is motion activated. Mm -hmm. 1153, three minutes later, it's I. Oh, and then it goes out. Then, one minute later, the front door, it's right out the front door. And well, what time is that? What's the time? 1154. 1154. And that's the last you've seen of, I guess, the door opening and closing until. It doesn't open up till 458 when I come home. And the back door yeah. from the garage. Yeah. Detectives gathered additional crucial information from Reed. Can we get um, one thing we do need? You said she had a card. You allowed her to have one of your credit cards. We need that number and that bank name. Yeah. If we can get that, that'd be great. Was it a debit card that she carried or was yeah. it a credit card? It was a debit card. Okay. And she used it for household expenses. Was it, it was from the bank that you bank with? Yes. That's on the, okay, what bank is that? It's Valley National. Now, was she on the account too? Yes. Okay. There's, there's been no activity on this card. The detective reviewed Reed's activities that occurred the previous day. Yesterday, uh, you had an 8 o'clock meeting uh, a little bit late for her. And I was at the uh, what apartment or Winter Center? Is that one in the same? And that was at 8.30. Okay. And then at 3.30, right, you had another visit. 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. And that was where? Oh, oh you were in Do you know whereabouts is? Because we have cameras and everything, and we're just trying to eliminate everything. Yeah. While at Reed's property, detectives collected a buckle swab from him in order to produce a sample of his DNA. Though it would appear to be a routine process, seeing how Reed was one of those closest to Jennifer, perhaps there was something more behind the request than just standard procedure. All right. The other thing was that I believe was Detective Wagner asked you about earlier was if you were aware of her having any male friends. And if you knew Jen, she's a really up, up person. I mean, she'd come at 630 mm -hmm. and man, she'd have it turned off like, hey, Alvin, they would do this thing. I mean, he just I mean, she's just fantastic. Outgoing personality. For, OK, so she wanted to go out like I bought her tickets to. um she loved Barbara Streisand. Oh, yeah. So I got her as a gift. Barbara Streisand tickets to Tampa. And she, oh, she liked to go to concerts and, and stuff like that. Though Jen was a lively person who enjoyed good times with friends, Reed didn't think she was the type to run off and leave everything behind. Though, there was one thing. You mentioned something earlier about the Enzian. There's a bar there. Um, and you say, does she go there? Well, my friend, 
And then what we were talking about last night, right? We were trying to figure out, like, you know, we were going, okay, how could this happen? Right. Like, where we didn't think worst case scenario. We just thought maybe she went out and had drinks with her girlfriend, and maybe she had a little too many, and then it was just unusual that she would have done something like this. But my friend did say that he's seen her at the Enzian. After work, after leaving here, with your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of her girlfriends or whatever, but she liked to have a cocktail with her girlfriend. You know, I had no idea that she ever even went to the but he said that's occasionally where she would hang out. This friend of yours, uh, we may need to talk to him. Can you give me his name? Sure. Anything will help. Yeah. Can I just ask you a question? Sure. They haven't found her body or... Oh, no. No, we haven't found her yet, so that's why we're keeping up hope. Has it been like a boyfriend or something and they took off? We don't know, and that's what we're trying to find out. Detectives had to probe all of the possibilities in order to ensure a thorough investigation, regardless of potential viability of each theory. They explored the idea of whether Jennifer had grown so tired of her routine that she'd left everything behind in search of a new life. Of course, it didn't seem at all likely that someone as reliable as Jennifer would do such a thing, especially considering the fact that she was due to be in Texas spending time with her newborn granddaughter on that very night. Suddenly, a shocking development landed in the laps of law enforcement. And if detectives had any suspicion of Reed prior to the finding, or if they'd surmised that Jennifer had left on a whim, all of that instantly dissolved with word of the discovery. Surveillance footage had been obtained from the Wells Fargo ATM, where the $300 withdrawal had occurred the previous afternoon. The time was 12.10 p.m., roughly 15 minutes after the last activation of Reed's alarm system at a location less than a mile from the residence. Though they expected to see Jennifer, what they found instead was shocking. Video showed a mysterious man stationed at the ATM. He appeared to be middle-aged and was wearing eyeglasses, a white t-shirt, light-colored shorts, and bright blue tennis shoes. He had a white towel draped around his neck and his hair was pulled back in a ponytail. On his left wrist was a watch with a distinctive plaid band. Reed was shown images of the man and the unique watch, but neither were familiar to him. Apparently, the man had later returned to the same ATM at 4.33 that afternoon and what proved to be an unsuccessful attempt to withdraw more funds from Jennifer's account. This time, however, he was dressed in different attire. He wore a dark-colored baseball cap along with what appeared to be a dark-colored jacket. His white t-shirt bore the logo Workout 32789, the numerals representing the zip code of Winter Park. In addition to the clothing change, another difference in the man's appearance was noted. This one, however, was chilling. The surfaces of his hands clearly exhibited multiple fresh cuts and wounds. When shown images from this ATM visit, Reed recognized the t-shirt. In fact, he stated that he owned one that was very similar to it. Upon inspection, it didn't appear to Reed that his bedroom closet or dresser drawers had been rifled through. However, this would come up later in the investigation. Detectives were able to track down Jennifer's contact, Janet Grimm, who'd been scheduled to deliver the framed art the previous day. Jennifer had texted Janet at 1018, stating that she'd be back at the residence in less than 10 minutes. Not long after this time, Janet stated she'd missed multiple calls from Jennifer's number. At 11.33, Janet picked up a call, and on the other end was Jennifer, who Janet could only describe as totally panicked. Jennifer stated she'd have to cancel the appointment as the school had just called and she had to pick Oliver up right away. Naturally, Janet found the conversation odd. She attempted to reach Jennifer on her cell phone approximately an hour later, but there was no answer. Evidence was beginning to mount. Also, on September 28th, Jennifer's SUV was located less than five miles from Reed's home in the parking lot of a public supermarket. The vehicle was processed for evidence the following day, on September 29th, two days after Jennifer vanished, and each finding was more grim than that which came before a beer bottle was found in the front center console. According to Robert, Jennifer would never drink on the job. There was no doubt in his mind that the bottle did not belong to her. A tan canvas bag had been placed on the front passenger floorboard. Inside the bag were a white t-shirt, a white towel, and a men's watch with a distinctive plaid watch band. 
Worst of all was the revelation that each item appeared to be stained with blood. The items clearly matched those the man was seen wearing on ATM footage from the first transaction two days prior, before the wounds to his hands had appeared. Word of a third unauthorized ATM transaction came on September 29th, but the location wasn't even remotely near Winter Park. It was in Jacksonville, Florida, where a $100 withdrawal occurred, approximately 140 miles north of Reed's home. A sworn statement via phone was recorded between Robert Fulford and a Winter Park detective that same evening. Did anyone have permission or authorization from you to withdraw that cash? No. Okay. And in regards to that transaction, uh, would you like to press charges, uh, if applicable, to anyone for criminal charges? Yes, I would. The most recent ATM activity cited in the statement was a major turning point in the investigation. It led detectives to contact the Winter Park Amtrak station, where they were able to get their hands on some critical information. On the afternoon of September 27th, a train ticket was purchased at 4.52 p.m., the destination being none other than the city of Jacksonville. And as luck would have it, there was only one passenger aboard that train. With this information, law enforcement had what they believed to be the name of a previously unidentified individual. His images had been plastered all over the media in an attempt to put a name to the menacing face. He was a 53-year-old man by the name of Scott Nelson, and a background check indicated that he was extremely dangerous and had an extensive rap sheet. Furthermore, Scott was currently on federal probation for armed robbery. Hope that Jennifer would be found safe was beginning to dwindle. The following day brought with it the much dreaded, terribly devastating news. Just three days after Jennifer was last seen, the worst case scenario had become a nightmarish reality. Jennifer's cell phone had been pinging off a cell tower located near a heavily wooded area of Orlando. Somewhere around noon, with assistance from the Orange County Sheriff's Office Aviation Unit, Jennifer's body was located. The gruesome discovery conveyed that the last moments of Jennifer's life had been absolutely hellish. But the true magnitude of the horror wouldn't be exposed until later. The merciless nature of the killing further motivated local law enforcement and U.S. Marshals, who'd been enlisted to assist with the investigation, to locate Scott Nelson. And it wouldn't take long. The day after Jennifer's battered and discarded body was found, the suspected murderer also turned up. It was shortly after 4 p.m. on October 1st that Scott was located at the Sunshine Inn Motel in Jacksonville just a half-mile trek from where the local Amtrak station had dropped him off. Initially, it was anyone's guess as to how the apprehension was going to play out. Law enforcement was aware that Scott didn't have a lot to lose. That, paired with his violent nature, could be a recipe for absolute disaster. The showdown began with Scott's refusal when ordered to exit his room, but it proved to be short-lived, and Scott was taken into custody without incident. However, the investigation had essentially just begun. A couple hours after his apprehension, the suspect had landed himself in an interrogation room. The following never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed attorney, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a licensed professional counselor. Thank you. Thank you. There's going to be a little bit of architect one Sure. So if you need to use the restroom, it's going to be longer than a little bit, as the detective described. The Winter Park detectives have the 140-mile trek to make up to Jacksonville. And as you can see, the extended wait time is starting to wear on Scott, approximately two and a half hours in. Scott has granted his restroom break, but upon his return, he'll still have an hour to wait. Finally, detectives have arrived at their destination, and they start by providing Scott with a warm welcome. All right, thanks. You got water? You okay? I could use something to eat. I have need something. I'm starving. I'm dizzy. I'm so hungry. Okay. We'll get you some. Okay. See, there's a... Uh, see you back in the grass. Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Yo, this guy got nice. Sorry for being hungry. Thanks. Oh, man, that's not a problem. You doing okay? Yeah. It's hungry, huh? Yeah, starving. What do you like to eat? Oh, God, anything. Anything? Oh, God. I'm not too fussy. You guys have oh, that's fine. I'm here. I'm here. I'm that's good. 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 I'm Is good. it pizza flavor? No, sorry. Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> what you guys? All right, Scott. So we'd like to talk to you about And I'm sure you probably have a million questions, too. So Yeah. The detective states that they have to go over his Miranda ride since he's in custody. He also swears in Nelson. This is not a court or official judicial proceeding, but perhaps an interrogation tactic to emphasize the desire for truthful answers. After Scott has confirmed that he understands the process, the detectives proceed to question him on his background, which is the basic baseline and rapport building of the interview process. Married? No. Okay. Hey, hey we're close. Nope. No, 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 no divorce or anything. No. Hey, you're a lucky one. Children? No children. Okay. Siblings? Brothers? Sisters? Yeah, I have a couple brothers. A couple Older. brothers? Okay, older, so you, you're the youngest, huh? Yes. After a little small talk, Scott is starting to grow impatient. Can I ask you yeah, something? Yeah, ask, ask away, go ahead. Um, it, I'm under arrest. Yes. What, we'll what are my that. charges? Okay, right now we got some, um, some issues with some credit card use. Okay, so I'd like to go into that, all right? And, okay. And, and say, what credit card? I don't own a um, credit card. Wait, so you don't own a credit card? No. You have a debit card, ATM card? I'm trying to think. I think I do. Okay, what, what do you think you do? What, what, what does that mean? The question causes Scott to freeze in place, and he hesitates to answer, ultimately going for the evasive I think response. This is a red flag for deception. It's a simple yes or no question. Of course, Scott doesn't want to provide any sort of answer here. The mere mention of a debit card likely set off alarm bells in his mind since he'd used Jennifer's debit card. I, I don't have enough information. I mean, I... I... That's what I said. Well, let's walk through it. Okay? Sure, okay. All right. Do you have any idea why you think you may be here at all? No. No, okay. Well, let's go back a little bit. Um, you were in Orlando last week? Mm-hmm. Okay. How long have you been in Orlando for? About four months. Four months? Where were you before you got to Orlando? Prison. Okay, so you got out of prison, you came right to Orlando? Yes. Were you in prison in Florida, or were you in prison somewhere else? Um, somewhere else. Federal. What made you come to Orlando? Um, it's just where they assigned me to. Oh, oh, for probation? Yeah. Okay, okay, so you're still, so you're doing some federal probation time? That's correct. Okay. Where were you staying in Orlando? With the mission. Which one? West Central. The rescue mission over there? Right by the old police station? Yes. How did you like the rescue mission? Um, okay? yeah. I mean, I, you know, no one really wants to be there. No. Now, were you working while you were in Orlando? Um, yeah, I was working for a painting business. That's in Winter Park. What they have you doing? Uh, painting uh, apartments. Apartments? Like new apartments or old apartments? Like refurbished or what? Like uh, the villages. And okay. Some, you know, pretty nice places. Are you still employed with them? No. When did that stop? A mm, couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. What yeah. happened? I'm just curious to know where, where this is all headed. Well, well, that's what we're getting to. Will I have an attorney coming in here? I, that's totally up to you. You tell me. I mean... Oh, yeah. No problem. What, what would you like? I, I think, I, I mean, since I've been arrested, I think it, I'd, I'd like an attorney present to speak. Scott is polite and formal in addressing the detectives, and he presents as confident when he expresses that he wants an attorney. Even if we didn't know of Scott's criminal history... It's evident that this isn't his first rodeo. He seems to know his rights and doesn't appear intimidated by the interview process. But just like that, after all that waiting, the conversation has come to a halt before it's really even gotten off the ground. While Scott wasn't in the mood to talk on that particular night, it would only be a matter of time before he'd have a change of heart, for lack of a better way to describe it. Because as you're about to hear, Someone who could inflict such an agonizing death upon another is as heartless as they come, truly evil right down to the core. It was a month to the day of their initial meeting when Scott mailed a letter to one of the detectives, expressing his desire to speak with them about the investigation. A meeting was arranged and took place on November 13th, 2017 at the Federal Detention Center in Miami. It's approximately 10.41 a.m. at MDC in Miami for an interview with Nelson. 
This time around, Scott is so forthcoming the details are likely to turn the stomachs of even the most seasoned detectives. However, the most shocking element of all is his alleged motive. It's utterly unfathomable. I know what you said in the, in the letter, and so I want to go over the letter with you. You know, I told you last time, I, there's, I know there's stuff you want to tell us, and, and we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, there go. The detective covers Scott's Miranda rights, then the conversation begins. What prompted you to write the letter? Well, yeah, because of the, 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 the conditions that they have me under. I'm treated uh, very hard where the other inmates aren't. It's got to change. I mean, something has to change. It's quite probable. I mean, you know, you guys may have the answers that you need, and I have that information. Essentially, Scott is admitting that he's willing to speak in order to gain better treatment for himself, not to help the victim's family or do the right thing. His motivation is self-centered and narcissistic. The detective is willing to listen to everything Scott wants to get off his chest. So this is your show. So what, what do you want to talk about? Well, for instance, uh, I was on the street for, for, for months and had nothing. I really had um, nowhere to go. I had nothing going for me. Really, don't. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to help you as well as help myself here. Well, you know, I mean, the life has really never been that easy for me. Do you know that I have a colostomy? I did. You do. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. you know, like the Bureau of Prisons, they, they, uh, they, they wouldn't give me the reconnection. They wouldn't, they would help me. I mean, yeah. uh, things are just in the toilet and they're getting worse and worse and worse and worse for me. And it's not going to stop until I'm either dead yeah. or, or something. They're not going to stop. That's what we don't want to see that happen. I, I mean, you know, I'll tell you right now. No, I don't want to see that happen. I, I know the detective. Scott continues to focus on himself as the victim in the situation and takes no accountability for what he's done. As far as, uh, you know, what, what created this whole thing to be, yeah. you know, I, um, I was thrown to the street again. And yeah. I had nowhere to live. I was I'm completely broke. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had been in Winter Park a few times. Okay. Okay. So uh, it wasn't the first time I'd been to Winter Park. What happened there was uh, I noticed that um, it's a very affluent yeah. type of, of it place. Is, yeah. It is. Well, people have a lot of money and things like this, and they, they have a different lifestyle. We're 15 minutes away in Orlando, where I was living. People are dead-ass broke. Yeah. I wasn't particularly happy with this. Quite the understatement we'll soon hear. It cut much deeper than that. It seems like Scott grew increasingly bitter and resentful as he took in the fact that he was struggling to survive while there were large communities of people not far from the shelter where he lived that enjoyed an excess of comforts and luxuries. It's important to keep in mind that people with antisocial personality disorder, ASPD, have a firm belief that they deserve everything, status, money, luxury, and comforts, whether they've actually done anything to earn these things or not. Their sense of entitlement makes them believe that they deserve and should be able to possess all these things. This is why they justify committing violent crimes, because they're willing to do anything to try to obtain what they feel is rightfully theirs. It also seems that Scott is highlighting social injustices, but ultimately, his beliefs seem to boil down to the fact that he thinks he's entitled to the same comforts that the residents of Winter Park enjoy. In addition, people with ASPD are extremely spiteful and vindictive. If they feel slighted by others, whether the offense is real or imagined, they will stop at nothing to get even. They won't feel satisfied until they have sought revenge. Oftentimes, their idea of getting even is retaliating in a manner that is far worse than whatever the original offense was. They don't believe in an eye for an eye, they believe in delivering a much harsher punishment than what was done to them. Scott states that he was released from prison that previous May and had been on the streets for about four months as the rage inside him continued to build. I'm, I'm willing to, to, to help you people because I'm going to be found guilty even if I didn't say anything. You have enough friends to get us to, to, to get capital murder on me right now anyway. It's very possible that due to Scott facing such extreme adversities during his probation, including issues with health care and difficulty obtaining food, it's likely true that he didn't care if he was incarcerated for the rest of his life. It's an extremely dangerous scenario to have an ex-con feeling he has absolutely nothing to lose. His worst-case scenario was going to prison for life, but maybe this wasn't such a bad outcome when he looked at the harsh reality of his daily life while being out of prison. 
Scott described the terrible conditions he was subjected to in prison, but it seems that the realities of freedom weren't that much better. People can become so used to life on the inside that, when facing life on the outside, they lack the skills to function appropriately in society. So um, I'm walking around Winter Park and um, all these people, you know, they, they have money, they have beautiful homes, beautiful families, cars, diamond rings, just driving the Mercedes and stuff. And, and I wanted to make it an example. Scott explains that during the month of September, he stayed at an undisclosed location. He gives his account of one night in particular as he sat in a picturesque gazebo of Winter Park. And it's very disturbing. And that's when, you know, about 11 o'clock at night, that's when, in my mind, I officially died. Okay, I died. I was, yeah. Okay. I died that night. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry you got to that point. I really did. Uh, and, and I'm in Winter Park. I'm surrounded by all this, this, this wealth. Okay. And, and here I am, right? I'm clean cut, I'm intelligent, I'm highly employable, I work like a dog, and I can't, I can't have nothing. I'm just dead. It was that very night that Scott made up his mind. He devised a horrific plan, and he was going to carry it out. I'm going to do a home invasion. Okay. So I knew that I was going to do that. Okay. I noticed this one house, and it was happening to be 5 o'clock, I'd say 5 o'clock in the afternoon uh, on the 26th. And I see Jennifer getting out of a vehicle with a young boy. Okay. And they go into the house. And I could tell just by the way she was dressed that she was not a... Uh, the first thing I just had in my head was she must be a house cleaner or, or something okay. of that nature. Okay. But I wanted to make an example of Winter Park. Right. Okay. Right. Like wrong or different, be it evil, be whatever. That's what I was going to do. It's ironic how Scott makes himself out to be the victim of the cycle of poverty and recidivism. But then he targets Jennifer, whom he admitted looked like a house cleaner to him. He claims to have a grudge against the affluent people of Winter Park, yet he targeted someone who he said himself was part of the working class and not the affluent class. This highlights that his actions really had nothing to do with the injustices of the world and everything to do with releasing his rage however he saw fit. One of the detectives poses the question we've all been asking ourselves. Why did you choose her to make an example? Everything came about that mysterious month of September where Scott has chosen not to disclose the location at which he was living. For the, for the month of September, I was living in a place, and there was a gentleman, long story short, they had known Jennifer, and they had had an argument. That's how I knew about that house that she worked at. Did he tell you to, to do what he did? Well, yeah. He said hey, killing her, wouldn't he wouldn't lose any sleep over it. But he leaves it at that and transitions straight to September 27th, and if Scott has been successful in garnering any sympathy from the detectives, it's likely that every ounce of it will now dissipate after he recounts the terrifying events of Jennifer's last moments. UPS. Right. Yeah, they had delivered a package. The guy delivered a package, the guy delivered a package and, and um, the minute he drove away, I went out and I rang the doorbell and, I, uh, and Jennifer answered and I said to her, uh, I said, you know, they have a package on the... Uh, on the doorstep, he was there, and uh, she said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, um, and she was looking at me a little lot like, yeah, I'm like, who are you, why are you telling me this, and that's when I uh, pushed the door to open in, and push it in, I went and shut the door, and, uh, and uh, she screamed, okay. and she was, you know, frightened, Sure. and I, uh, uh, I had a knife, so I told her to lay down on the floor, and then I, I bombed her with some uh, zip ties, okay. I said, I'm not going to I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just here for the money. Okay. And uh, she was not very helpful with my needs. This statement shows Scott's grandiosity and sense of entitlement. But this is also an example of victim blaming, something that individuals with antisocial personality disorder commonly engage in when they commit crimes and violate others. I mean, he here is an honest citizen, and she's probably never told many lies in her whole life. Sure. And all of a sudden, she runs into a bad guy, and now she wants to lie on him. Or whatever happened, you give the guy what he wants and let him leave. No, no. Did that just make the situation worse? Yeah, yes, it did. It, it, it made it a lot worse because I'm just trying to get some boots and money and, and, and whatever. Scott then explained that he felt Jennifer was purposely misleading him. She gave him the ATM card and pen but didn't disclose that she also had a debit card tied to Reed's personal bank account. She did, however, state that Reed had some expensive watches located in his bedroom. 
So I went upstairs for a second. I got the brown comforter out of the bed. I wrapped her in the brown comforter and put her in the back of her own vehicle. Okay. I loaded her up through the front door. And then, uh, then I left. So she was in the back of the uh, vehicle, and I left with her. Okay. I went to the ATM machine, and I withdrew the $300. Jennifer was absolutely terrified. She was trapped in a compact space, wrapped tightly in a comforter, and having difficulty breathing. As for Scott... Then I, uh, <laughs> I you know, went shopping. Kind of cold-blooded, isn't it? You're showing the amount of compassion that you got shown is what it sounds like to me. I'm not firing on all my cylinders, but the thing is, I mean, I have my faculties. I know the difference between right and wrong. This is one of the confounding realities of individuals with antisocial personality disorder. They are aware of right and wrong, but they don't care. Their own needs are always at the forefront of their thoughts, intentions, and actions. I uh, wanted to have the owner go to the bank to withdraw a large enough sum of money so that I could, uh, you know, abscond. And that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we have a check in the back of the vehicle, and I have $300, and now what do I do with her? Right. So now I'm driving, trying to find a place to find Jennifer, where I can put her. You know, and she's telling me, you know, through all this whole experience, even in the house, she says, I'm really afraid you're going to kill me. Right. Please don't kill me. Right. In all reality, I'm having a hard time having compassion because I've been brutalized for so many years. I don't even know what compassion is anymore. This could be a true statement. When people experience long-standing trauma, they can become numb and essentially void of any feeling or emotion. Alternately, those with antisocial tendencies tend to lack the capacity for emotion and connection to begin with due to neurological differences. So it's possible that this has always been his version of normal. It's the human condition. Yeah, absolutely. Her phone started ringing. Stuff I just shut it off. So I finally found a place to put Jennifer. Yet again, Scott confirms that the killing was completely premeditated. He details a purchase he made that consisted of items that would be used to murder an innocent person who happened to be in the wrong place at the worst possible time. Purchased all that at Walmart. Walmart? Yeah. How many days before? Um, I think perhaps a week before in Princeton Street. Okay. I, I purchased it with a check. Scott's estimation was close, just off by a few days. He made the purchase at Norlando Walmart the afternoon of September 16th, 11 days prior to when he carried out Jennifer's murder. This confirms that whether Jennifer cooperated with Scott's needs or not, he was going to murder her. There was nothing she could have done. Detectives met with asset protection officers at the Walmart just three days after the confession and saw it all on surveillance footage. Scott had purchased nearly $500 worth of items, including food, several cartons of cigarettes, and blue tennis shoes. And then there were the most incriminating items, a utility knife with a green handle, a package of 18-inch cable ties, and a roll of duct tape. Please be forewarned that the following description may be too graphic for some viewers. Scott eventually located a secluded, wooded area, and sadly, it seems Jennifer is well aware that there's no chance she'll make it out of the brutal attack alive. So I uh, got her out of the vehicle, and she started getting louder and louder, so I put some duct tape. Could she breathe <clears throat> with the tape? Barely. Put it on her face? Very little. Now she's pleading for her life. Did you ever hit her in the head, or did she ever hit her head on the ground or anything like that? Back of her head? Yeah. Yes, I punched her. When? Prior to duct taping her up. I stabbed her three times that I didn't remember. Remember where? Yeah, once in the back, another time in the back, and then the third time I, uh, I was walking away, and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm not going to let this testify against me because they're going to give me the same amount of time so I killed her I put it one through her heart she she put me away for the rest of my life anyway so I mean you know you know so I killed her and she went on a gasp and that was it and she died calling her a name is Scott's way of depersonalizing her it's a distancing technique so that he doesn't have to see her as a person even though she hasn't done anything to him but try to comply and survive what did you do after that? I drove back to the uh, public. 
Scott cleaned the blood off of himself and changed clothing in the men's restroom. It was then that he replaced his T-shirt with the Winter Park one, shown in the photos from his second visit to the ATM, which occurred that day. However, he wasn't able to mask the wounds he'd sustained on his hands as a result of the heavy brush he'd trudged through in the wooded area. I dropped the vehicle off and I went back to the park to get my belongings. And then um, I sat, you say, I sat there and I thought about what I've done, everything, and I was hungry. Yeah. Aside from the fact that this shows his complete lack of moral conscience and empathy, Scott being hungry after the murder indicates yet again that his only objective in life is to fulfill his own needs. People with severe antisocial personality disorder are not emotionally pained or otherwise affected by inflicting harm on others. Their threshold for feeling emotional pain for another person is very high, and in some cases, such as Scott's, non-existent. Scott ventured to a nearby 7-Eleven and, of all things, he purchased a pizza. Well, I, I, I call it the blood pizza okay. because the reason why I called it that is because I, I ordered the pizza and I bought a beer with, with the highest level of grace that I could muster. I was actually proud of what I did because of that. after all the years that I've been kicked in the face by the Federal Bureau of Prisons and all the years that not attacking, attaching my colostomy and all the years of getting beat up and tormented and everything, I finally had a certain level of, of self-respect. I finally made someone pay for all the that I've been through. And so I, I took my blood pizza because somebody died for me to get this pizza. Mm -hmm. So I walked down and I'm holding the beer and I'm walking and I'm dressed immaculately because I've washed myself and everything in public. And I'm walking down the street while all these rich people are walking around buying jewelry and they're having their good life and all this stuff and wouldn't give a crap about me. And so I'm carrying my pizza. Little do these bastards know what, what I had to do for this friggin' pizza. Yeah. And, and I walked back up to that gazebo and I ate that pizza, every bite of it, and I enjoyed every deal of it. And I really did. And I, I hope. My only regret is that I hadn't killed 30 more sons of bitches later. It's almost like Scott felt he was one of them for a short time, like he was living a piece of the good life for once. He felt vindicated because, unlike the rest of the Winter Park community, he believed he really earned that beer and pizza. It also seems like Scott was taking pleasure in knowing a secret that the community hadn't yet discovered, one that would frighten them and make them feel like their city wasn't as safe as they thought it was. He enjoys feeling like he took something from the citizens of Winter Park. He stole their peace of mind and burst the bubble they lived in. And he seems to like this because he likely feels as if others are sharing in his misery. An utterly chilling account. But clearly, it was all in vain. You know, this is the evil part of it all. With the with concern to me, after everything that's been going on, here I am, I'm back in Winter Park, and nothing's changed. You know? Okay, uh, I may have a couple hundred dollars in my pocket. A girl is dead, mm -hmm. and I still have complete contempt for Winter Park. Did it, did it make you feel any better? No, mm -hmm. it didn't make me feel any better, but I, I just don't understand how things are the way they are. A truly senseless death, and his motive behind it all was even more shocking. After Scott's gut-wrenching version of the nightmarish day concluded, one of the detectives asked why it was that Scott reached out with his letter and came forward. And as Scott explained it, he wanted his story to be heard. Clearly, he felt he was the victim. He also quite obligingly filled in the missing pieces. He hadn't intended for the murder to go unsolved after all. I left everything for the block force to find. Okay. The knife, I threw that there about 70 feet from the murder of the body. Yeah, that's her vehicle. And is that the vehicle that you took that day? Yep, that's it. Is that the vehicle that she was in the back of? Yes. Um, that day when you were at the house, did you did you eat any food there or drink any beverages or anything? I took one beer. The empty bottle found in Jennifer's car was the one he stole from Reed's home. And is that comforter that you took from the... Uh... Yeah, that'd be it. Um, this picture, this house, does this look familiar? Yeah, that's it. 
uh, and Jennifer uh, Fulford. But in stark contrast to how Scott is able to speak of his victim so casually, without so much as a hint of emotion, he can't hide the fury he feels, apparent in his voice as he speaks of the true motive behind the murder. And it's like nothing we've ever heard before. I was doing really well. Okay. Okay, in society and the street. Right. I had a job. Then my probation officer came in and he, he premeditatedly and deliberately went in to, to sabotage it and blow it up. So, really? oh, oh, yes, sir. The probation officer did everything he could in his power as a man. He yeah. woke up that morning just as premeditated as, uh, as I did. Yeah. Okay. I knew what I was going to do. All right. right. I, I needed money. Okay. And, and I did what I had to do to survive. Okay. All right. He did what he had to to put me in that position. People with antisocial personality disorder do not take any responsibility for their actions. It's always someone else who caused them to make poor decisions. Maybe Scott felt he would punish the law by breaking the law. He seems to believe that his probation officer had sabotaged his job and source of income and that these things warranted him committing a crime. In his mind, it's all a conspiracy. Law enforcement decides who will be placed on a path doomed for failure. They really had a notion in their head that they wanted to destroy this guy sending him back to prison. I mean, they, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have certain individuals. Oh, of course, yeah, of course they do. And, and things started adding up, you know, I, I had all I could take. And uh, uh, it, it just something happened to me that I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I, I had, I'm hungry. I'm a felon. I have no, I'm homeless. I, I tried to do everything I could to, to abide by the law. Yeah. But they're going to put me in prison anyway. The bottom line is this, is that my probation department, the feds, they put me in this situation as well as those people, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I still walk around the closet yeah, and because of that. Okay. No, and the, the, yes. You have no idea how, how sick and evil that is to do to a man. However, Scott's assertion that various government agencies were what drove him to murder wouldn't get him very far. He'd said it himself. There was enough forensic evidence to tie him to the murder. The beer bottle contained Scott's DNA. In addition, the white T-shirt, white towel, and watch with the distinctive band that were located in the canvas bag within Jennifer's SUV had been analyzed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensic Lab. Each item showed visible staining that appeared to be blood, and the stains were confirmed to match both Jennifer's and Scott's DNA profiles. Is there anybody out there that is looking for a more? Oh, yeah. Okay. And those are the people that I really want to try to help. Right. I understand. Despite Scott's claim that he understands, he declines to divulge any additional information, and the interview ends. Whether there's any truth in his assertion remains to be seen, but the idea, as terrifying as it is, could be all too real. We know exactly what Scott is capable of. Before his trial, Scott wrote to the judge and, true to his character, He made even more shockingly selfish statements. In the letter, Scott claimed that he had already admitted to unsolved armed bank robberies and that he promised to divulge information about eight homicides he committed, ones he has never been caught for. Why would he suddenly give up that crucial information? Well, Scott claimed that since his arrest, he had lost 40 pounds of body weight because he doesn't get enough food in prison. He made his demands very clear, writing... I'm starving to death, and I'm asking to be fed more food. That's right. He would admit to eight murders in exchange for more food in jail. The trial wouldn't take place until late June of 2019, nearly two years after Jennifer's brutal murder. Scott elected to testify, likely against the advice of his attorneys. He told all of the heinous details of Jennifer's last moments. Not surprisingly, he continued to blame his parole officer entirely for Jennifer's death. The idea that justice could truly be served in a case such as this is unrealistic. If nothing else, however, Scott didn't receive the sentence to death he'd sought. He was found guilty on all counts, including first-degree murder, and was sentenced to life in prison without any chance of parole.